We've asked a special uh, guest to come here today and uh, who's done extensive research and can really give us some good insights and, and so that we have some perspective on what we have been doing and where we're heading. So I'd like to welcome him uh, to stage with a round of applause, Thomas Carruthers. Thank you. Um, after the talk, there'll be room for some questions, but just one question for you. Uh, the, the, how do you feel about this, uh, this celebration of 15 years? I never get this kind of warm up. This is great. <laughs> I could have brought my cello, you know, I'm a musician, and you guys didn't tell me about it. I'll tell you next time. But 15 years of NIND. I'm going to talk about that. Okay, let's go. Let's go! Round of applause! Thank you. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here. I had the great pleasure 15 years ago to be in The Hague speaking at the launch event that inaugurated NIMD. And uh, being back here again 15 years later in the same role, I think it says something. Uh, it says that despite all the progress of NIMD, they still haven't expanded their list of keynote speakers. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> that'll come in the next 15 years, I'm sure. <laughs> I've had the good fortune over these 15 years to see the organization operate in the field in Africa and Latin America and Asia and elsewhere. I visited the offices, talked to staff and partners in the field, had the chance to be part of events at headquarters, strategy sessions, informal consultations. I've met NIMD people at international workshops and watched them interact with the rest of the community. And it's been a heartening story of institutional growth, sometimes in the face of adversity, both because of developments in the field, also sometimes developments at home. But because of the dedicated leadership, first of Ruhl von Mechenfeld, who acted with tremendous determination to get this organization started, and then the steady hand of the current executive director, Hans Brüning, and above all, because of the hard work of the staff, both here in The Hague and the partners, many of whom are here today, the organization has thrived. Now, looking at this audience, uh, I have to say that the diversity and the size of this audience is a testament of your interest in IM, NIMD and the reach of the organization. And I think the audience, in all its diversity, geographically and politically and professionally, is unified by that. But I think the audience is also unified by a concern about the state of democracy in the world. Democracy, as we know, is, is facing some very serious challenges. And it's hard at times not to have the sense that many bad things are coming together. A kind of cascade of negative events that is almost hard to, to make sense of because the news comes at, comes at us so quickly and often so harshly. So what I'd like to do in my short time today is talk a little bit about that cascade. I'd like to describe it. Then I'm going to give a little bit of a perspective on how maybe we should think about it in slightly different ways. Then say something about its implications for international democracy support. First, the headlines of the negative cascade are familiar to you, so I'll just go through them very briefly. We've seen Russia, unfortunately, come to the belief that Western democracy is a threat to Russian national interest, to, and to resist efforts to support democracy there and to broadcast out an authoritarian model to some of its neighbors. We've seen China thriving in some ways economically, but exemplifying a kind of authoritarian model of development that we worry is gaining attraction in the world. In the Middle East, we've had the devastating news in the last several years of the hopeful movement toward democracy in, of 2011 and 12, turning into almost a nightmare of extremism, and conflict, and horrors. In a number of other countries, we've seen backsliding and reversals in places where we didn't expect it and where it can be very discouraging. Not far from here in Hungary, uh, a prime minister has voiced adherence to illiberal values and started to practice them. Thailand experienced a military coup. Venezuela has been on the, the knife edge of democratic politics and, and uh, suffering terrible convulsions. Burundi is in the news today for uprisings and violence over continuity of a president and a possible democratic deep democratic reversal. So we see this pattern of backsliding in many parts of the world. And in addition, we see a general pattern of closing space 
for independent civil society and human rights in many countries around the world, and not always authoritarian countries. India has been, unfortunately, striking out against civil society organizations as one part of a whole number of measures taken by governments to restrict space for civil society in recent years. And last, but by no means least, we feel at home, both in my country and the United States, but here in Europe, we have doubts about our own democracy. In the United States, it's hard not to be very discouraged by the political polarization we experience. Terrible situation of political financing we're foisting upon our, our public in a way. In Europe, there are all kinds of internal doubts and dissensions, issues of intolerance, issues of adherence to values, unity. I don't need to name them here, uh, being in the heart of Europe. All of these factors combine in a way that, as I said, presents a very negative scenario and discouraging. What I'd like to do now, though, is just go back through it and urge us to try to look more deeply within it, because there's a tendency in trying to make sense of complicated world events to, to reach a single factor kind of explanation and to say, oh my goodness, democracy is just going down the drain. It's not. <clears throat> For example, the fact that there are challengers on the international stage who aren't part of the Western democratic order is a part of a diffusion of power that's been occurring in the world over the last 10 or 15 years that is, in a sense, the normal order of business, uh, given that economic, sort of the economic balance of power is changing, and with that comes a change in political and strategic power. But the power is not just diffusing to Russia and China. It's also diffusing to democratic countries. Brazil is playing a much greater role in its region and a pro-democratic role. In Asia, Indonesia and Southeast Asia is exerting an interest in democracy in the region. India is trying to play a pro-democratic role, at least in parts of South Asia. South Korea, Japan's finding its feet in some ways diplomatically. Democracy is asserting a more a sort of more self-confident role on the international stage. So first we have to be careful when we, we see the heterogeneity of power, not to reduce it down to a single dimension. So for example, the influence of China and South America, interestingly, China has become a, a huge trading partner in South America, buying up all kinds of primary products and commodities. But actually, if you talk to South Americans, part of the reason South American democracy has been sustained over the last 10 or 15 years is the economic growth in the region which is a result of the market to China. And so there are more complex effects if we just sort of try to pigeonhole a country and say it's playing this role in the world. We need to look past those superficial ideas into the complexity of it. Secondly, when we think about authoritarian models and we worry that there's this kind of new authoritarian capitalism, again, we look into this. Russia, for example, some people in the world are certainly impressed by Russia's apparent decisiveness and assertiveness and self-confidence in geopolitical matters. But it doesn't take a very close look at Russian governance and the realities of how Russia is, in a sense, the Russian power establishment is running that society to realize it's not a well-governed country. They are not making good use of their abundant natural resources. They are not harnessing and developing the remarkable talents of the Russian people, which are such a special, talented, gifted people. Russia is a very badly governed country, not a model for others. China, of course, has achieved remarkable economic success in some ways, despite economic devastation, suppression of rights, and a climate of fear. But if you take the Chinese model, which may look apparent, and say a minister from a small landlocked African country comes and says, I want that Chinese model. I'd like to have that 9% growth for 30 years. You might have to answer him and say, well, let's see. <clears throat> Do you have 300 million, 400 million people surplus labor ready to work at low wages for a couple of generations? Uh, do you have ports that easy access to the most economically dynamic region in the world? I don't have that either. Do you have a tradition of a Mandarin class and excellence in a civil service? Oh, no, weak state, uh, and so forth. You might say, actually, if this small African country wants to be like China, I'm not sure the Chinese model is going to be all that helpful. <clears throat> so heterogeneity in terms of power relationships, the models may not be what they seem. What about the Middle East? Well, it may be tempting for some to give democracy the blame for the cataclysms that we see in the Middle East and say, we tried that democracy in the Middle East. Look what happened. It's a fundamental misunderstanding. What we are seeing in the Middle East, in places like Syria and Yemen and Iraq and Libya, is the legacy of 30, 40, 50 years of dictatorial rule that failed to build cohesive social contracts among different ethnic and religious and tribal groups 
It's the legacy of authoritarianism that we see festering today. And to blame that on democracy is a strange twist of, of intellectual logic that doesn't conform with the realities of the region. And to prescribe more authoritarianism as a solution to the terrible legacy of 50 years of authoritarianism has it deeply backward. With respect to the backsliding that we see in the different places, it's true, there is discouraging news. But bad news sells better than good news, as we know. And so it's true that Hungary is giving cause for concern. But next door to it, Romania made actually in some ways a helpful choice, or a hopeful choice, in its presidential elections of last year, a vote for reform. Thailand has had a coup, but Sri Lanka came out of a presidential election in a surprisingly positive way. Venezuela, as I said, at the knife's edge, but next door, Colombia, seems to be achieving a historic peace agreement. Burundi and other African countries in political turmoil, but Nigeria made, again, some ways a hopeful vote in its recent presidential election. It's a mixed picture. For every reversal, there is also positive news, which we tend to pay less attention to. And finally, in this regard, there is closing space in many parts of the world. <clears throat> there are many governments trying to reduce the ability of independent civic actors to operate. But let's ask ourselves, why do they care so much? Because they know, they feel it, they fear it. There is an underlying powerful trend in the world of citizens to tolerate less abuse from their governments, less willingness to tolerate incompetence and corruption, a greater willingness to communicate with each other, to organize, to inform themselves, and to act. That's why space is closing, because power in the citizenry has been building. So again, a more mixed picture. So we should be careful about thinking the cascade is all in one direction. What we see, in, see instead is an international context defined by heterogeneity, by complexity. Steps forward, steps backwards, steps to the side. What's the place of international democracy support in this? I've been really struck in the last year or two how some policymakers, experts, journalists in different Western capitals have been saying, we gave that democracy support a try. Uh, this doesn't seem to work. <clears throat> Let's do something else. I'm kind of amazed by that because <clears throat> it reflects a fundamental misunderstanding in at least three different ways. First, it ignores the fact that all it takes is an airplane trip to any one country. You could go to 100 countries around the world, and you will meet hundreds and thousands of people in that country who have been touched by the world of this kind of assistance. Maybe they took part in a workshop. <clears throat> Maybe they were part of a facilitated dialogue. Maybe they had the chance to organize a, an initiative on their own thanks to some external support. Every country that has experienced some kind of political transition has been touched by this kind of assistance, and it has animated the lives of thousands of people. And to simply say, well, that's meaningless. Russia isn't where we wanted it to be. is simply a, a blindness to the realities of what's been going on over the last generation. Secondly, a second form of misunderstanding is a deep lack of realism about what one can achieve with relatively limited resources. Sure, it sounds like a lot of money is spent on this, but I was testifying before our Congress a couple of years ago, and one of those proverbial, though he was real, <coughs> skeptical congressmen looked at me in a sort of harsh way, said, uh, we've, been, we've been voting for billions of dollars for this assistance, and what do we have to show for it? And I paused, and I said, well, <coughs> Representative, I said, it's true. The budget is sizable of US democracy systems to almost $3 billion a year. It's a lot of money. I said, it's almost as much money as you guys voted to add one lane to the Wilson Bridge over the Potomac River that connects suburban Virginia to DC. And so <clears throat> you could add one lane to the bridge, or you could try to change the political destiny of 100 countries. And you expect that the money was enough for one lane is enough to change the political destiny of 100 countries? Are you serious? I didn't get invited back for further hearings. <clears throat> And then third, it also represents a misunderstanding in that this process is long and it's difficult. Look at Mali, for example, a small country in Africa, a poor country, but which in the 1990s began to make some serious progress towards pluralism and a kind of working democracy. 
And the West was very happy about that and provided assistance and kind of felt proud and used to name Molly all the time as a good student. In, in the last 10 years, Molly hit some very hard times. They were a shock to many people. Rebellion from the North, extremism, horrible violence, the exposures of terrible corruptions and divisions. Yet people have been there in Mali. We have a gentleman. He's right here. He's been working in, for NIMD, or, or its partner organization in Mali, for nine years. I was sitting next to him yesterday evening at dinner, and I said, how is it going? And he, he just said to me, it is so difficult. And I knew in the way he said that, he's committed. He's there, I suspect, taking personal risks. Could be doing other things with his talents and his education. But he's there working. And we come along and say, we were there for the good times. We enjoyed those first 15 years. But wow, this is a lot harder than we thought. Should we leave? What would that say about our understanding of how democracy occurs in the country? What would that say about our moral courage? Now, it's true that the democracy community in its first 10, 15, 20 years was sometimes naive. It had several characteristics. It tended to view democracy work as, I used to call it, rolling boulders down a hill, as though democracy was a kind of natural process. It tended to think that you could, quote, export models. People always said they weren't trying to export models, but they were in many cases. And people assumed the doors would be opening to them, that they'd be welcomed in doing sensitive political work in other societies. Now, they've discovered that all of those things aren't true. And the good organizations, the serious ones, and the serious practitioners have responded. And in each area of the democracy field, in elections work, political party work, parliamentary work, media strengthening, civil society work, civic education, and I could name others, you see practitioners who are trying to roll boulders uphill, not downhill. And what that means is they realize their vested interests working against reform, that they have to be clever in finding agents of change to help roll that boulder uphill. They realize that exporting model doesn't work, and they're focused on trying to exchange knowledge, often between countries in a region who've each had different experiences in bringing people together. And that this isn't about the West exporting something to the rest. It's about all of us working together on common problems. They realize the doors aren't opening to them, that for every positive reception they get, there's someone else in the power structure who doesn't want them there and who resents them, but they've gotten tougher and smarter about packaging their message, operating in different ways that fit through those narrower doors, and they're working on that. <laughs> NIMD has been part of that evolution, of trying to be sort of smarter about change, trying not to export models, but to work in a genuinely local way, trying to fit through narrower doors. So I think NIMD has been part of the leading edge of this assistance that I've seen over the last 15 years, and I salute them for that. And so in closing, I would say that <clears throat> a 15th year anniversary, it's an odd number. It's not 20 or 30 or 50. It has the sense of a partiality of, it's, it's not maybe even halfway, it's partway. And that's suitable. And I think, because I think this difficult context, properly viewed, it stripped away our illusions. But let's not let it strip away our intelligence, our dedication, or our courage. Thank you for letting me be a part of this event. Look forward to your questions and comments. Yeah. One more time, an applause for Mr. Cohen. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, you can stand the arts. You can. It's very good, very good, very good. That's the spirit. Um, but obviously, time keeps on ticking, and so we, we have one question, and then the others should approach uh, him later. Is that okay? Because otherwise we'll be running out of time. So who has a question? Oh, come on. Yes, the gentleman over there. Oh. Wait a moment, I will come towards you. You're going to give the microphone because everything is being recorded. It's going to be on the website tomorrow. So if you want your children to see you jumping up and down, just tell them to look at the website tomorrow. Uh, uh. Thanks, thanks a lot for the talk, uh, Samit Bissari with International Idea. I just wanted your comments on, on one aspect of the talk that you touched on at the beginning, which was the trouble that, that Western democracies find themselves in. So, so you addressed a lot of the other issues you raised at the beginning in terms of uh, different models 
Um, do you see this as a, a long-term trend in, in uh, Western democracies, not living up to the standards that we set yourselves, or if not, how is it reversible? Thanks. It's reversible through the systems themselves, if they remain open to the citizens and give the citizens space and the ability to do that. I mean, what we see in Spain, for example, is an attempt of a seriously democratic society to try to work within its own system to renovate itself. And I was in Spain a couple of weeks ago, and I had the chance to meet with senior people, both in Podemos and Ciudadano, to talk about what they're doing and why they're doing it and who they are. And I was impressed that this is a, an effort by serious people in this sort of Spanish society to offer an alternative. That's where renovation will come from. But if you close the channels of access of citizens, in a sense, to power, then you're, you're creating difficulties because you're institutionalizing uh, power holders, and in a sense, institutionalizing decay. And so it's up to us looking at our own systems. The potential for renovation is there, is right here. That's what democracy is. And Western democracy still has that potential, and we do see signs of that. But it also, as Frank Fukuyama had said in his important article last year and as part of his most recent book, the sources of decay can also be found within democratic systems, and we have to challenge those. Thank you. Thank you so much. And sorry that we don't have enough time for extra questions, but later on you can approach him and ask him, because uh, you'll be here still. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. Well,